My name is Christine Iho, and I teach art history at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And I am also the author of this book. In this talk, I'll introduce major issues that shaped the fine arts in 1950s and 1960s China. I'll also explain different ways for thinking about the critical questions of socialist art and its significance to modern Chinese art. The book features over 80 color reproductions of paintings, sketches, and drawings, published for the first time in English, and beautifully produced by the fantastic editorial staff at the University of California Press. In this talk, I'll show several images that could not be included in the book to demonstrate the wide range of image making encompassed by this period of art history. The book examines how art was made in the early People's Republic of China. A truism about art in socialist China is that artists were mandated to obey the ideas laid out in Mao Zedong's famous Yan'an Talks. The Yan'an Talks call for art to intervene in making political ideology. Rather than making art for art's sake, artists need to, to respond to contemporary political problems, and artists needed to make art for peasants, workers, and soldiers rather than the elite. How did artists make art in the service of politics? A central assumption of this book is that it was not obvious how to interpret the Yan'an talks when making official state art. Even when the Yan'an talks became the central artistic text after the Chinese communists came to power, Art administrators and artists had to define a new state style and create methods for addressing a mass audience. The solutions that artists came to were extremely varied as they sought to create socialist realism for the Chinese context. There were sprawling grand paintings that depicted the history of land reform and the history of the Chinese Red Army. And these paintings expanded upon inspiration from European realism, naturalism, Soviet socialist realism, as well as Impressionism, Post-Impressionism, Expressionism, and many other artistic movements. At the same time, there were also paintings that employed the traditional techniques of Chinese brush and ink. These brush and ink paintings were in various genres, lengthy panoramic hand scrolls depicting water management, scenic views capturing new cultural heritage tourism, and landscape paintings memorializing sacred revolutionary sites. I answer these questions. How did artists create socialist realist painting for a new state culture? How did artists learn to become cultural workers? How do we account for the disparate visual styles and forms that became the fine arts in the People's Republic of China? And what conflicts, challenges, and visions were expressed by this experimentation with style and form? Going into life was the central unifying artistic practice of this period. Going into life entailed artists witnessing the lives of peasants, soldiers, and workers to render their experiences visible and representable. The way that artists recorded their contact with life was through the act of mass sketching. The method of socialist realism was mass sketching. This book describes why and how the act of sketching became revolutionary. Throughout these sketchbooks and the process by which sketches and drawings became paintings, we see the manifold forms of socialist life come into being, delineating what might be called the politics of recognition. Who is seen, what is represented, and what becomes the subject of art. Why was the process of drawing important? Art academies in early socialist China were founded upon Western-styled art schools that had been established in earlier decades. These academies had espoused drawing as a modern form of art education. Drawing pedagogy was therefore seen as an agent of modernity. However, art administrators also saw that this kind of classroom education could become overly academic, divorced from life. Studio drawing needed to be complemented with a more socially oriented practice. As part of what was known as mass line campaigns or open door education, Art Academy students and teachers would periodically travel to a local village to eat, sleep, work, and create alongside peasants. Beyond learning to represent the agrarian revolution, artists also sought to revolutionize themselves mentally as well as physically. Russian ink painters also went on mass sketching trips to reform themselves in mind and body. 
They then confronted one of the major challenges of this period, incorporating cultural heritage and elite traditions into revolutionary culture. Through mass sketching, they sought to create new brush languages to create a national form of socialist realism. From this rich and complex matrix of artistic practices, the modern art academy, social praxis among rural communities, and negotiation of cultural traditions, new genres of state art merged, ones that can still be seen today. Construction landscapes of the technological sublime, what was known as military affairs painting, the diplomatic sketch, and sites of revolutionary pilgrimage. It's simplistic to call these works mere propaganda. Instead, to understand the complexity of these pictures, it's critical to acknowledge how these genres sought to create revolutionary modes of experience. For example, construction landscapes channeled sophisticated media environments, as painting competed with the proliferation of images across pictorials, photography, photo essays, and film. Another way to understand the complexity of the art of socialist China is that artists each brought disparate ideas of art history as they made state art. Even as military history paintings depicted the life of the Red Army, such paintings also engaged with contemporary debates over the role of form and the meaning of style in making socialist realism. Mass sketching was not only focused on the Chinese Revolution in isolation, but was also networked within histories of Cold War cultural exchange. East German, Indian, Romanian, Polish, Czech, Soviet, British, and artists of other nationalities set off to tour China, and Chinese artists traveled in invitation on exchange tours as well. On these trips, making and gifting the diplomatic sketch memorialized an internationalist vision for mutual relations with Second and Third World Bloc. Finally, through mass sketching, groups of artists visited revolutionary pilgrimage sites, such as Red Crag. To depict Socialist China's new cultural geography, they each produced their own versions of these landmarks, competing with each other to innovate new approaches that would be commended, reproduced, and ultimately become iconic. What does mass sketching reveal about the nature of making socialist realist art in high socialist China? First, artists were not mere agents of the state. Artists sought to reconcile personal convictions with state ambitions. Second, making with socialist realism was a complex and negotiated process. Socialist realism in China drew upon myriad visual references, art histories, media environments, international relationships, aesthetic debates, and political pressures. It required continual, unceasing experimentation to realize the politics of recognition that was its goal. And above all, the making of state painting was a critical and important episode in struggling to find another path for modern art, in making Chinese art modern. I hope this gives you a preview of what's in Drawing from Life. Thanks for watching, and I hope you'll find a copy in your local library.